Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Bolton Council Corporate and External Issues Scrutiny Committee being held on Monday, the 24th of August 2020, and it's just after 6 pm. I'm Councillor Richard Sylvester, the chair of the committee, and I'd like to welcome anyone who's watching us online. Thank you for tuning in over the internet. I'd like to welcome the councillors, the members of the committee, and also our council officers to the meeting. Uh, we'll get on with the agenda and item one is declarations of interest. If any member has a declaration of interest, uh, just unmute and speak into your microphone so that I can hear that you have a declaration. There are no declarations of interest. Item two is urgent business. Is there any urgent business? Uh, I'll ask our, our committee admin officer, Vicky. No, Chair, there is no urgent business. Thank you for that. Item three is apologies for absence. Any apologies, Vicky? Yes, Chair, I've got apologies from Councillor Wild. I've also got apologies from Councillor Adia and Councillor Iqbal is deputising and Councillor Patterson and Councillor Sanders is deputising. Thank you very much for that. Item four on the agenda is the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, these were sent out to members by email and there are three pages. The meeting was held on the 3rd of August 2020. We've got three pages, G1, G2, uh, oh, G3, and there's a fourth page, G4. Uh, now, I'm going to ask if any members have anything to raise on the minutes of the last meeting. If you do, just speak into your microphone if you wish to raise anything on the previous minutes on the 3rd of August. No members have indicated. Uh, so therefore, can we accept the minutes as a correct record? Uh, um, I move them as a correct record. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Could somebody second that, please? I'll second that. Thank you very much. And which, which councillor was that, please? Councillor Matt Mulkin. Thank you very much, Councillor McMulkin. Uh, therefore, we'll just members speak into microphones and say accept if they accept the minutes. Yeah. yeah. Accept. Accept. Yeah. Uh, accept. Thank you very much. Those minutes are accepted. Uh, item number five on the agenda is the proposed committee work programme for 2020-2021. Uh, and I'd like to thank members who uh, at the last meeting uh, raised potential uh, work programme issues and topics and to those members who emailed myself and also Vicky, our committee admin clerk uh, with other uh, potential subjects for the uh, work programme. Uh, so. Uh, we've, I've collated them, I've had a meeting with the Vice Chair and our officers and what we've come up with, um, a standing item at each of the corporate uh, scrutiny committee meetings on COVID-19 and council finances. So that will be a standing item on each of the following meetings. We've also got down the Cube Fire and the Council's role response. Areas around marketing, including a presentation on Big Bolton. And this will be a presentation putting Bolton in the spotlight and countering negative social media with positive stories. Neighbourhood man management, narrowing the gap and targeted funding, including statistics. Uh, how grants are issued. Now this will be on tonight's agenda under Bolton's Fund. So we'll have that um, presentation this evening. Digitalisation and Agile Services. Now this one is to cover uh, digitalisation Agile Services working, covering the one-stop shop services, Agilisys, key directorates and how such services can be introduced throughout the borough, in particular in the outer townships, without leaving residents who are not computer or smartphone literate behind. Then a presentation on community safety issues. 
Now, this will be involving uh, police dispersal orders issued in the borough. The problem of nitrous oxide canister usage by young people, knife crime in the borough, and how trading standards operate to stop young people buying knives through test purchases. And then finally, um, working from home. Uh, this will be a presentation on corporate buildings and their usage and how staff are working from home during the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, those are the items uh, which um, we've collated and uh, we am asking members to uh, approve the work programme for the municipal year. So would members uh, now speaking to the microphones if you approve that work programme? Approve. 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 Thank you very much. Is there any members wishing to ask anything on the work programme? If you would uh, type uh, speak into the chat box and Council Peel has indicated that he wishes to speak. So we'll go over now to Council Peel. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, it's just on one of the items you mentioned, and you, 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 you mentioned a little addendum to it, and that was the uh, digitalisation uh, issue. And you said in particular uh, townships. Can can you just take us through the rationale there? Is there a particular um, issue that's been identified with townships? Because I thought that in terms of inclusion in um, <coughs> um, digitalisation, it was more to do with uh, income. Uh, and age rather than geography. Yeah. So unless I've missed something about any particular uh, wireless gaps in the borough or any kind of fibre optic gaps in the borough, I mean, it could be that. Uh, but but other than that, I thought the, um, the, um, the, the, the parts that we should really be worried about are basically to do with age and, and income levels more than geography. So if you could just, just explain that one. Thanks. Yes, uh, we have some uh, members from the outer townships who particularly wanted the outer townships included in such a presentation. So some examples during the presentation will be made um, on the outer townships as well. Uh, we felt that um, the outer townships should be obviously included in, I mean the whole of the borough is included in the presentation, but some examples uh, of, of services in the outer townships as well, which came from uh, councillors in those outer townships. So that's why it was included. And we've got a can question. I, can I Sorry, come back to that? Yes, you can, Councillor Peel. I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure I quite understand what you're saying. Um, but what I suppose what I'm what I'm seeking is. Uh, reassurance uh, from yourself, Chair, that um, the issue of um, the well-known issue of lack of access to council services uh, via digitalisation is to do with uh, lack of experience, lack of knowledge, i.e. age, uh, and is also to do with lack of equipment, i.e. income levels. So can I have your assurance that, that those two issues will, will be central to the uh, digitalisation, um, but well, to pass it on to Councillor Muslim and others, that those two issues will be central to uh, the Council's programme on digitalisation. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so we've got a question now from Councillor Madeline Murray. So we'll go over to Councillor Murray. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's it's similar to uh, Councillor Peel's appeal to you um, and especially when we got the Bolton Fund uh, papers this morning which highlights um, that uh, elderly and uh, those of lower income um, tend to be um, in a minority for using digitalisation 
and the working from home, I don't know if we're going to link that together because um, that will have uh, uh, an effect on the budgets, won't it? Uh, if staff are, are going to um, be working from home rather than the buildings. Thanks, Chair. Sure. Um, I will try and uh, slot those two presentations into the same evening, if that's uh, of a help. Uh, we've got a question from the Leader of the Council, Councillor Greenhouse. Councillor Greenhouse. Uh, thank you, Chair. It was just to clarify, really, um, Councillor Peel's uh, point. <clears throat> Certainly, the, the ambition is to uh, have it borough wide. It's, it's not to uh, exclude, and I think it's probably been a little bit misleading. Obviously, the, the towns within the borough play their part and they uh, there is an opportunities there to create uh, hubs within those communities uh, that maybe be the answer uh, to some of the issues raised. Uh, but clearly the, the uh, clearly the ambition is to make sure that nobody's left behind from no matter what part of the borough uh, they fall in. And that, as Councillor Peel quite rightly says, is, is often due to um, uh, generational issues and, and in other areas will be more to do with uh, economics um, and social issues. So so just to give some reassurance, really, uh, that the, the ambition is clearly within the whole project is to is to reach out to all aspects of the borough. So just to say that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Greenhouse. Uh, we've got a question from Councillor Paul Heslop. Councillor Heslop. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, the point was in relation to uh, Council. The point was in relation to Councillor Peel's uh, question uh, about services um, and access to digitalisation uh, is important in in areas or in towns like Kersley that we have facilities to be able to um, use so that the population of Kersley that had currently been left behind are able to familiarise themselves with digitalisation and that is important there is no access to them in Kersley, in Kersley certain, certain parts of Kersley uh, actually need to take three buses to get into Bolton. So it's important that if there is digitalisation, there's actually services and training in Kersley itself and, as Chair mentioned, in the other outlying townships of the borough. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Heslop. And I'll just clarify the wording of the presentation is um, uh, how services can be introduced throughout the borough, uh, but in particular in the outer townships without leaving residents who are not computer and smartphone literate behind. So we'll have, we'll have some examples from the outer townships, uh, but the whole borough will be included in this presentation. I, I did point out to councillors that it's a borough wide presentation. It's not just focusing on one ward here or one ward there, otherwise we'd have to have 20 presentations. But some examples will be given in the outer townships. Um, I don't think there's any more questions um, which have been indicated in the chat box. So therefore, um, I will slot all of these um, work programme items into the meeting schedule uh, over the forthcoming year. So I will slot them in. Um, and um, if you leave that to me as chair, uh, at the next meeting, you'll have the work programme with all of the items slotted into the relevant months. So we will now go on to our next agenda item, which is item number six. Now, this is the Directorate of Corporate Resources Finance Report 2020-2021, quarter one. And we're going to be taken through this presentation by David Shepherd. David.
Is uh, David there? Because we can't actually hear anything. Councillor Sylvester, it's John Duckett. I'm just looking through the attendees and although he's accepted, he's not actually appearing on the list of attendees. OK, well, therefore, what we will do is we'll go to item seven if somebody can contact David or if somebody else can take us through that report later. We will go through to item number seven, which is the Reaper uh, inspection. And um, the Reaper inspection, this is the... Chair, Regu if it helps you, the Borough Treasurer has just indicated she may have some news on that item. OK, Sue. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I've just had a message from, from David Shepherd. He's struggling with his internet connection. OK. So um, I'm very happy to take any questions on the report, should, should members have them. I can see a question from Councillor Hayes. I'm just waiting for the red box. Thank you, Chair. Um, under section five of risks, I'm very surprised to see that we don't do anything about a risk from Brexit, particularly a no deal Brexit. Normally that should be covered, shouldn't it? Can I ask what the view of that is? OK, Borough Treasurer. An interesting question from Councillor Hayes. Indeed, um, I, I think at this stage we are probably waiting just to understand exactly what a no deal Brexit would mean for the council's finances. Once that is much clearer, we will obviously be able to uh, to build something in. Um, but at this stage, uh, we're just waiting to understand that. So I think probably as we move towards the end of this calendar year, um, we will probably be, be interested in what what is announced. What you know, if we don't get a deal, um, how that will actually directly relate to the council as opposed to more the the national economy, where there may be greater impacts. But it's under a watching brief, and we'll feed that through as and when we know a little bit more detail about what risks we would actually be facing. Thank you, can, Chair. Can I come back on that, please, Chair? Yes, you can, I mean, Councillor Hayes. Most economists accept there are risks in any form of Brexit and very big risks in a no deal Brexit. I certainly think I fully understand quantifying it's very difficult because the government seems to have massive difficulties understanding it themselves. Uh, but I certainly think we should have referred to it in a report. We can't ignore the fact it might be a risk. I think it should be in the report. Borough Treasurer, do you want to reply? Yeah, I mean, I mean, happy to take that away. Uh, I think I think it's point well made. So happy to look at that and just see as we move into subsequent uh, monitoring reports that come back through committee, how we might be able just to to raise any awareness of any issues that we are we are finding. So happy to take that away. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That will no doubt come up again. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to go over to now to Councillor Peel, who has a question on the finance report. Councillor Peel. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Borough Treasurer couldn't possibly be expected to answer questions about Brexit, but uh, I would uh, I would broadly support what Councillor Hayes has said because uh, in previous uh, exec member meetings, um, I've certainly raised the issue, the early signs uh, of problems uh, to do with procurement um, and, and, and a number of issues around that. So I, I do agree with the thrust of what he's saying. Um, the reason I wanted to speak was I did raise some issues with uh, Councillor Greenhouse at his exec member meeting about the um, just just within his element of the council's entire budget. We're already seeing uh, quite a significant uh, overspend uh, and um, efficiencies not being realised as a result of COVID. Um, and early on in the, in the pandemic, the government uh, made some bold statements, which no doubt they probably regret. Um, uh, along with a lot of other statements they probably regret, which is that no council would be uh, financially worse off as a result of COVID. 
So a lot of our overspend in, in corporate resources is to do with the very sensible decision to put a massive investment into IT. It was the only way to keep the council running, the only way to keep democracy running, the only way to keep uh, our officers in their job. So I commend the council for doing it. But what I would like to, to know from either Councillor Green or Shelder, the Borough Treasurer, um, is I hope that our significant investment into IT, which has caused an overspend, which has caused us not to be able to take efficiencies out, is one of the areas that the government recognises as being COVID related. So when they say no council should be out of pocket as a result of COVID, I would hope that that is one of the areas. I'm pretty confident that Councillor Greenhouse will, will agree with what I'm saying um, and use um, all his good offices to, to make that point. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Peel, and we're going to hear from Councillor Greenalch now, if he does agree with Councillor Peel. Thank you, and we've heard this phrase before. I agree with Nick somewhere, haven't we? Uh, yes, I do um, agree, and as, as has been reported, um, the Council during COVID has had to give regular audits uh, about its spend, which were COVID related, and I can assure you that that was that spend was recorded as as obviously a, a direct result of uh, of, of uh, how we had to operate during during the pandemic. I do have to say, in the long term, this this has to be a invest to save in the long run, because I think we all appreciate that that the ability for many of us, not just in councillors, but a num many of our staff to work uh, much more agile and work from home will be the way forward. It isn't it isn't the complete answer. Um, and it isn't, uh, you know, we have we have to have that more detailed debate about what level uh, of staffing we have and, and return when we look to any kind of normality. But it certainly is an area where we can make considerable savings. And once uh, we get our uh, new assistant director who will run with the digital working with Councillor Muslim, uh, I can I hope and envisage that will be many savings down the line as a result uh, of new ways of working. But I can assure it, it is an area that we we have highlighted with government in terms of getting uh, that money back when we've delivered uh, our audits. Thank you, uh, Councillor Greenhouse. Thank you, Councillor Greenhouse. Um, Sue, have you got anything further to say on the report? No, I think that, that covers all the pertinent points, uh, Chair. Thank you. OK, thank you. So there are no further questions on the report. So we will now go to item seven, which is the REPA inspection. And um, REPA, uh, so that everybody knows, stands for the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. And uh, Patricia Ashcroft will take us through this report. Uh, Patricia. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, Good everyone. Evening. My, my name is Patricia Ashcroft. I'm the Data Protection Officer at Bolton Council, and I'll take you through this report. The Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, which has been said is known as REPA, provides a framework within which Bolton Council must comply when carrying out covert surveillance. So this generally refers to hidden cameras, not the cameras you see around the town centre and in public buildings, which is overt surveillance. So in order to comply with the law and the codes of practice that sit under it, the Council has a REPA policy and guidance which are available to staff on the intranet. The Council can only use the powers under REPA for serious offences that attract a maximum custodial sentence of six months or more, or criminal offences relating to underage sales of tobacco or alcohol. There is a body known as the Investigatory Powers Commissioner's Office, IPCO, and they carry out inspections of public authorities every three years. This normally involves an inspector coming in to the town hall, looking at our policies, our procedures, training records, etc., and interviewing staff. This year, obviously, that wasn't possible due to COVID. So the inspector requested copies by email of all the relevant documents and they were provided to him. 
He reviewed those documents and then followed it up with a, a telephone interview with staff in May. Following that, the inspector then issued a report in the form of a letter and also attached another letter relating specifically to data assurance. Copies of those two letters have been provided to you at Appendix 1 and Appendix 2 of the report. During the inspection, the inspector asked that a minor amendment be made to the corporate policy to reflect the fact that councils cannot use urgent applications due to the fact that we require approval from a magistrate before we can use WAPA. This recommendation has been accepted and the policy will be amended in due course. I must stress though that no formal recommendations were included in the final report and the inspector was very happy with the documentation that was provided to him. This committee is therefore just recommended to note the report uh, and the inspector's report and the letter that he sent. So it's just purely for noting and information at this time. Unless you have any further questions, thank you. Thank you, uh, Patricia. And I'm just going to ask if any members do have any questions. Uh, Mark Cunningham, Councillor Cunningham, has a question for you, Patricia. Councillor Cunningham. Hello, thank you, Chair. Uh, hello, Patricia. Just to, could you just clarify uh, the bit about um, needing a magistrate? Um, that, that's usually in a lot of cases. Why is it that we couldn't get a magistrate to sign a request in, in a short space of time? We have plenty of magistrates in the town if we needed to do so. I wasn't quite sure why they, they picked up on that point. Um, I think it's just when normally when you would do an urgent application, you would fill in an application form and an authorising officer, which is someone within the council, would sign that form and you could carry out surveillance immediately in something that you wanted to do in an investigation. But because we have this additional part of the process that we have to go before a magistrate, it's, it's not sort of deemed to fit in with the urgent we call the urgent application yeah. requirements. I mean, the, poli the police themselves, if they need an urgent warrant signed, they'll go and wake a magistrate, a friendly magistrate up in bed sometimes, you know, and, and do it that way. I, mean, I would yeah. have thought it wasn't beyond the wit of man that we might be able to do the same. However, for the moment, not a worry. If, that, if that's where we are, that's where we are. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cunningham. Uh, nobody else has indicated to ask a question. So could I thank you very much, Patricia, for guiding us through, us through that presentation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now we come to item number eight on the agenda. And this is a COVID-19 update. And we're going to go back to our Borough Treasurer, Sue Johnson, who will take us through this soon. Thank you, Chair. So, um, a, 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 only a very brief update for me this evening, um, as it's, it's so soon since our last scrutiny meeting. So, our estimates, financial estimates of the impact of COVID for the full year um, still remain at just under 40 million. Um, and as reported last time, we have received 20 million pounds worth of the emergency government support, in addition to which we've also had a number of uh, specific grants, so for example, track and trace was two million, council tax hardship fund uh, three and a half million, infection control in care homes two point three. Um, the the grants to businesses has now ceased. We we have we have handed out the money. All businesses have now received that money. So the only thing we're now awaiting is the detailed guidance from MHCLG as to the income losses that we are now able to claim for. Um, the, it's going to be quite a detailed return, so MHCLG are just working through the practicalities of how we're able to provide that information to them. Um, as soon as we get that information, we'll be able to submit our claim and we will continue, as requested by the government, to fill in the monthly returns for our estimated costs and our, our loss of income. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Sue, and the Vice Chair, Councillor Hornby, uh, wishes to ask the first question. Councillor Hornby. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Sue, just uh, in relation to questions that I've, I've asked in other places in the past, is are we confident that government will give us uh, all the money that we need, or are we going to be out of pocket? And the, and the second question is in relation to our schools. 
which are hopefully reopening very shortly. They've had to do a heck of a lot of alterations to get ready for this. I know schools are responsible for their own budgets, but is there a thing set in place in order that they can recuperate their losses as well? Thank you. So I think the, the government have been very clear that they um, do not want to see any local authority fail because of the impact of COVID dealing with that in addition to running all our essential services. So um, we clearly are in the position where we've received emergency funding both for our initial costs and also for specific additional responsibilities. Um, in terms of our ability to to deal with this though, we also need to recognise that the council does hold reserves and the government have asked us how much reserves we have. We will have to utilise some of these. I think it's really important to recognise that, you know, in, in many instances, um, don't, uh, you know, don't think everything's going to come externally. We need, we need to look after ourselves at times and that's what our reserves are there to do and we need to prioritise them. But the government have equally been clear that if there was any local authority which is really struggling, it must contact MHCLG for additional support. Now, we are not in that position. When we look at the forecasts and we look at the impact in this financial year, plus, a, you know, a use of reserves that, that we can reallocate, we are nowhere near, you know, that emergency one one more support. So that that is a really good good message to be able to give to this committee. Um, in terms of the schools, um, you're absolutely right. You know, schools are in charge of their own um, budgets, um, and and they they have been asked to do a lot of work in able to return, you know, the staff and the pupils back into a safe environment so we continue the children's education as, as a priority. So I know that the Department of People has been working really closely in terms of what support we can give them and equally if we need to give them any help in, in lobbying the government if they are out of pocket we are very happy to be able to do that to, to support that so we you know we prioritise the children's education. Can I, can yeah, I just, can, yeah, can you just can. come back on, sure. on, on the first part of the question? Uh, accepting that um, government don't want to see any local authority fail this council over many years has been very good with its finances and has um, been in a fortunate position where we've held quite a, a substantial amount of money in, in reserves and we could now in theory then be penalized whilst other authorities that have run with virtually nothing may get extra money is that is that the case um you, you could argue that theoretically. I think I would say that actually we have been um, very well managed financially for a number of years. We are in control of our budgets um, and that we are able to um, to manage a situation like this successfully. Um, with asking for additional support off the government, there may be consequences in terms of that in the longer term. Um, and there may be a lack of flexibility in managing budgets in the future. I don't know, but actually I'd rather be in our position where we are able to look after our council services and the destiny of this council in a much more um, manageable way um, than, than others may be faced with. So I think I'm very comfortable with, with our approach and our ability to, to, to make sure not only can we deal with COVID, but we can keep running those essential services for our residents at the same time. Thank, Thank you, Sue. Thank you for that. Thank you, Sue. Uh, we come now to Councillor Hayes, who has a question. Councillor Hayes. Thank you, Chair. Just waiting for the red box. Um, I think, Sue, everybody accepts what a good job the people have done in getting the grant money out fairly quickly to help our businesses. And the first part of isn't a question, it's to say, can you pass my thanks, certainly, and I'm sure other members of the committee, for the hard work they've done to get those grants out. But the question is about the grants. Um, have we actually allocated all the money we had available? Uh, or is there some money left? Or conversely, did we have more claims for grants than we had money available to give? So we we have paid all the claims which were eligible under the scheme that the government set. We obviously did receive 
a few which we rejected um, because they were not eligible for one reason or the other. Um, so we have paid out all the claims. Um, we have maximised the additional discretionary scheme money, the 2.9 million that was made available. So anything that is left has to be passed back to the government because there is no extended criteria, but it, it, it is quite minimal. So we, you know, we've, we've probably paid now on just over 60 million pounds out, which I think, you know, thank you for your comments to the team because they have worked incredibly hard on doing that. And it's great that we were able to do that to support our, our local businesses at this time. Thank, Thank you very you. much for that. Thank you, Councillor Hayes. Uh, we now go to Councillor Peel, who wishes to ask a question. Councillor Peel. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks Jay. It's just for the Borough Treasurer to confirm um, something that I'm, I'm sure um, I heard at the last scrutiny committee. Councillor Hornby asked an interesting question um, which was, are we, he said something like, are we absolutely sure uh, we wouldn't be out of pocket for all the loss of income? And the borough treasurer um, skillfully danced around that. Um, <laughs> she knows I'm a great admirer. But surely at the last scrutiny committee, we were told that the government scheme for loss of income is only after the first 5% is, um, is put to one side. And then it's only 75% of loss of income. So to answer Councillor Hormby's question, we're not going to be covered for loss of income because that's the rules. And the other point is a significant source of our income, of course, is Manchester Airport dividends, which the governments have decided they're not regarding that as income. Mm -hmm. um, my question then is, can the Borough Treasurer confirm that is still the case? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a so you're absolutely right. In terms of the, uh, the income, uh, claim that the government has set out. We disregard the first 5% of budgeted income and then we can claim 75% beyond that. Um, the, the exact details of that, exactly which income lines are eligible, we are still awaiting. Um, the government have said though that, that commercial income, which includes the dividend from the airport, is excluded, uh, unfortunately for us. Um, which is why in my previous answer I was referring to you know the use of bringing in reserves held by the council to balance our budget that is when we will need to, to be doing that to balance to balance the budget uh, so I hope I hope that's that's clear council appeal okay thank you council appeal and we're going to go over to the leader of the council David Greenhouse Councillor Greenhouse Thank you, Chair. It, it was just to uh, make scrutiny aware of another piece of the jigsaw that's that's yet to just fall into place. Um, and uh, that is, I think, a few a month ago, maybe five weeks ago, there was a, a GMCA meeting um, where I raised about the issue of the reserves held at GM level, uh, of which are considerable. Um, and there was definitely a move uh, for following that to look at with the GM Treasurer uh, to look at what possible reserves may be available to come back. So there is a paper being prepared. I can't go into um, huge detail. I hope you'll forgive me at the moment about the the amount uh, that, that is being that we are talking about in as leaders. But um, that should be some uh, additional help, which is which is to come from reserves, which are in effect our uh, money, it is our money that's there, uh, which is uh, from uh, such things as waste reserves, um, retained business rates, uh, some reserves held within uh, transport, some reserves held actually within um, uh, the ability to uh, match fund for uh, housing all uh, allocations which, which have not been needed. So there is a substantial amount which is being looked at currently, which will be coming to the September GMCA meeting which should be another bit of the jigsaw which does come back which which is sought to obviously uh, help us with the financial position so i thought it was worth just raising that so scrutiny where there there is another pot of money that is being hopefully uh, being accessed and being worked on currently thank you chair thank you uh, councillor greenhouse and there are no further questions on your report so, so can i thank you very much for that update. 
and we'll carry on with the agenda. We're going to go to our main presentation now uh, for this evening, which is on Bolton's Fund. And uh, taking us through this presentation, this presentation has been sent to members in advance. So if um, you have any questions, just type speak into the chat box as we're going along. Uh, we'll go over now to Michael Kane, who is going to take us through this presentation. Michael. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's good to get the opportunity to, to speak to scrutiny the, this evening uh, around the Bolton's Fund. Um, I mean, th th what we've 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 named this uh, presentation as Bolton's Fund Restart and Recovery. Um, you will see there is quite a large slide deck attached, um, and uh, hopefully I will not uh, destroy you all with overdoing the PowerPoint. A lot of the detail within this slide deck is is about the detailed evidence that we'll be looking at as part of the various rounds for the funds. So I don't really intend to go through much of that with you because I think I'd rather that you um, you can uh, take your own time to have a, a look at some of that detail. Um, if I could move on to the next slide, please. Um, just a bit of context around Bolton's fund. Um, as, as you will all um, I appreciate we had we got started with the Bolton's Fund at the tail end of 2019. Um, the the new approach to our funding uh, with voluntary sector groups was approved in October, and we had the, we had the the fund up and operational within a few weeks after that. Um, our first set of uh, awards were around children's grants, and they were small small awards. Uh, and as you can see from the slide, we managed to fund about um, 19 local groups uh, and also CVS were able to add some additional uh, funds to the £50,000 that was available through the, um, the Bolton's Fund. Um, at the start, uh, and, and then at that point, we'd actually developed a full timetable of, of grant rounds that would have taken us right through uh, 2020 into 2021. And the first set of um, um, round that we were looking at was around cohesion funding, and we had that underway by February. Um, we had the Skilled Alliance, which is the big fund, which is awarded to Bolton Wanderers Community Trust as the lead within an alliance of a range of groups uh, to do some work over two years. We also had set out a small grants fund at that stage um, and we had allocated £50,000 for that. Uh, we had to put that on hold though because obviously um, not had to, we had only just got started when obviously the, um, the pandemic um, had started to hit us. At that point we had to actually put a freeze on the overall uh, approach to the fund at that stage. Um, However, it quickly became clear that we needed to do something to support um, the local um, voluntary sector and we were very quickly able to get around uh, together and managed to get £50,000 delivered across April and June to support communities to deal with some of the, the impacts of COVID-19 and to allow groups to, to continue to look at new ways in which they could connect with their communities during that period. Um, so we we now are in a position where we really need to get the fund restarted and we have about 1.4 million available uh, in, in one-off funds at the moment. Um, we are hoping that the fund will grow and I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Uh, can I move on to the next slide, please? So I think just I, I think is a bit of a, a recap around why we are doing the Bolton's Fund uh, the way we're doing it. I mean, when we first started to work with our partners on this piece of work, and this really has been a, a, a very strong collaboration uh, from the council with other partners. Um, one of the, the key things that was 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 a bit of a frustration uh, was that there were many funding pots and many routes and avenues for groups and it could all get a bit confusing and it was all probably costing us all in terms of bureaucracy to run various grant funds and, 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 and it was felt that we could probably do better working together. 
and and I think as the the fund that we produced at the end of October showed that that was that was quite a strong possibility for us. The other thing we wanted to ensure was that we got a fund that was much closer to the need as evidence through things like the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment and that community insight that we get from uh, work with the, the voluntary sector. And indeed, we also wanted to ensure that we were aligning our work with the key priorities as outlined in the vision work. And I think we've managed to achieve that. Um, and of course, so we now have the single funding route as, as defined in the, the Bolton's Fund. Um, the other thing about that is it makes it a lot clearer for groups in the community as well. And I think for me, one of the real benefits uh, to doing the work this way is if we route the groups into CVS, uh, we're routing them into a whole, uh, a whole much bigger approach in terms of the funding and development support that is available to them. And in some cases, actually, for groups, the Bolton's Fund won't be what they need. They may need some other support or they may be routed to other funding opportunities. And I think that is a real improvement in what we had previously. Um, Co-design is very much at the heart of the work we do. Um, we have worked very closely with Bolton CVS, Bolton at Home, uh, the CCG, the Foundation Trust, and a range of key voluntary sector partners to, 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 to make the work move forward. And, and I think one of the points we put there is that we are now finding that it's, it's appealing to people as investors. Um, and recently we've had the CCG indicate that they are going to put a significant um, piece of funding into the fund. Uh, and the last few months we've also had additional funds made available from um, uh, grant funding um, organisations uh, and also a little bit from the private sector too and we want to continue to do that to make that as an opportunity that, that people want to fund in that single funding unit for Bolton. Um, the other thing that, 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 that really helps now is in terms of the, the, the decision making around grants that we have now moved that to a range of independent and trained panels that are overseen by Bolton CVS and will be supported by experts from across the council and from those other organisations. But I think what we have is a much clearer way of, of making decisions around how grants are awarded to groups. Can I move on to the next slide, please? So obviously for a few months, the, other than the, the COVID-19 resilience uh, funding, we've had to, to have the the fund on a bit of a hibernation. But as we've started to talk to the voluntary sector and to our partners, it was quite clear that there are some, some priorities emerging alongside the evidence we already have around what we should look to fund going forward. Um, we, we have clearly had a, an indication from the sector around the need for more digital work. For many, for many of the sector organisations, they had to become almost digitally enabled and digitally delivering overnight when, when the pandemic hit. Uh, and it was interesting relating that back to a little of, of the, the conversations that were had early in the meeting around both access to and, and, and actually literacy uh, when it comes to dig, digital uh, uh, projects. And I guess that's one of the things we will be looking at in terms of that voluntary sector offer. Um, quite clearly, mental health and well-being had become uh, highlighted more as an issue. And of course, other things that we had been planning to do that we've had to put in hibernation for a bit are now going to restart. So we were intending to do some work around engaging communities on climate conversation. That work's restarting and we wanted to reflect that a little bit in the work of the fund going forward as well. One of the other things that will be recognised because we've had a bit of a learning period uh, was that in terms of our work around the fund, I think we wanted to um, improve how we actually our communications around the funding as, as we move on. Uh, because although we got moving with the fund quite quickly, I think we didn't really stop and get a proper communications plan in place. I think we've addressed that now, which is, is hopefully should be a benefit to the fund uh, going forward. Uh, can I move to the next slide, please? 
So just very quickly, in terms of how the fund itself operates, I think it's, um, I suppose, the hierarchy of how it works in a sense is that we, as the people uh, who operate the fund, uh, we will take our strategic steer and focus from our, our politicians and from our key partners. What are the things we think we need to focus on? We then take that information into our co-design group, which has got senior officers from a number of those organisations um, that I mentioned previously, working to, together, collaborating to try and come up with uh, better solutions. Um, and then the decision making, I think, as I said previously, is now made by these independent panels. Um, so in terms of restarting the fund uh, for this living with COVID period, um, we have looked at our vision priorities. They are still relevant. We are now focusing much more clearly on our, our evidence of need through the joint strategic needs assessment, especially as we get more information that's building into the GSNA, which is really helping. Um, we had some emerging themes, as, as, as outlined in the previous slide, uh, from the recovery process. And we are also using much more, and I think it's quite important to recognise this, that we do get a lot of community insight and evidence from the voluntary sector about what we should do, um, which, which actually helps us to mix that alongside the actual evidence to hopefully come up with uh, better solutions for the fund. If I move on to the next slide, please. So this is just a, a, a reminder for members about the levels and the, the, the kind of uh, things that the fund will look to support. And it's basically, I'm not going to go through all of that, but it scales from very small awards up, up to about 1500 and then up to 5000 all the way up to what we call scaled alliance and when we're looking to to build a scaled alliance that's really around some sort of very specialist areas so hence the cohesion work was to pull together a number of organizations to work together on cohesion and it's when we're looking at things at that level we want to get a number of organizations collaborating together and um, to support us uh, if we move to the next slide, please. So having done the work to this stage, I think this is the, the slide that is indicating the next set of rounds that, that, that we want to pursue with the fund. Um, I mean, one thing I would say is the way we are building this fund, we hope that, that, that we will be, um, we can respond to need as it comes up. And if we get some need that's recognised, we will shift things around and make sure that we we get we can get around developed and, and delivered quickly if it's needed around a particular area. So that just gives you rounds that, that we are planning to take through to the um, pretty much the end of this year and the start of next year. As well as doing the work on these, we will also be looking at the next sets of 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 areas that we would want the, the fund to focus on based on that evidence of need that we have. Um, next slide, please. OK, so the next series of slides is a lot of detail. Um, I'm only going to, I think, talk to the first slide here and then I'll push on through. I think if members can then have a look at the, the detail that, that, that then exists within all of that, they can get a sense of how we are now trying to focus much clearly, much more clearly on the evidence that we have. Um, and so basically for this the round four and digital exclusion, what we want to do is on, on the first column here, we have what the, the data that we have available is telling us. The middle column is really what's come in from, from the, the sector. And then the final column is really what we think are going to be the targeted outcomes from that. So in terms of the digital inclusion, and, and it was interesting to place this and talk about this one, given some of the debate earlier. Um, clearly, uh, the, there is some evidence of, 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 of people uh, not having access 
or having the, the, the digital skills necessary, necessary to participate. For us, in terms of the work we're doing with the voluntary sector, that message has been replayed back to us as well. And I think one of the, the, the things that we see is for voluntary sector organisations to be effective going forward, they need to be better themselves at both how they use digital offers and actually how they increase digital skills within the sector. So that again is, is one of the reasons why we've got that focus on that. Can I now move on to the uh, slide that, that, that looks at the uh, communications plan, please? Okay. Um, I think, as I said earlier, one of the one of the quick areas of learning from when we launched the fund uh, back in um, November 2019 was that we needed to we needed to promote the fund better, uh, and we needed to work better collectively uh, uh, and use our collaboration uh, approach to, to achieve that. Uh, so one of the things we've done is we've pulled together a group of of the the, the key communications officers from the, the council, um, Bolton at Home and CVS, and we've actually tasked them to provide us with, with a plan to work, uh, to work through the comms uh, for the fund. Part of that is to ensure that local groups know what's coming, because uh, one of the, and another one of our early learning points was that um, groups just saw Bolton Fund and they applied whether they, they would they would have been eligible for that that bit of the fund or not, and it was a bit of a waste of time. So we want to make sure that groups understand what is coming, when it's coming, and when it will be f better fit for the work that they do. So we've we've worked up a communications plan on that. We want to use um, social media much more effectively on that as well. Uh, and I would really welcome once we start putting stuff out on on our Bolton Council. Um, uh, channels. It would be really great if, if if members were able to support that and and get that that message further out to to folks within their communities. Um, next slide, please. So, again, that whole approach to having a much better and better planned approach to 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 the um, the the mid. The, the comms and media around the fund. I think what we've agreed is that, that we need to do a sort of four pronged approach for each of the rounds so that we make sure that people understand better what, what we're doing. One of the other things I think we need to we, we need to really push on as well is to make sure that people understand the absolute value of the fund and we make sure that we get those good news stories um, and and the impact of the fund because uh, I think when we did the first round, we had a, we had a small session uh, when we still could with the groups at Bolton CVS, and it was really, really appreciated. But obviously, given where we are now, we're going to have to think a bit more creatively about how we spread that good news about what the fund's doing. If we could move on to the, the final slide, please. So in terms of that is a very whirlwind tour around what we're trying to do with the bonus fund. There's an awful lot of work that's going on in the background. Um, we are ready to restart. Uh, we have got some comms going out tomorrow, I think, which will be highlighting what we plan to do in the first rounds. Uh, we are currently working with CVS to finalise any guidance and, and application forms that we'll need for the various rounds. Um, we will be looking to celebrate the success of Bolts Fund much more. Um, and again, just to again reiterate, I think the Bolton's Fund is starting to be seen as a, as, as a really good piece of work. And I think that that, that is reflected in the fact that the Leader and Chief Executive have managed to secure that additional funding from Bolton CCG. And for me, I think it's also how else do we start to grow that fund? And that's one of the things we're going to be looking at. Um, we also want to regularly review that fund, make sure we are meeting the needs uh, uh, that are highlighted, making sure that the, uh, we are, we are, we are, that the fund will be spent according to those needs 
um, expressed in GSNA alongside that community insight. And we will be starting to do some work on what the programme is going to look like from January 2020 on, uh, onwards as well. Um, so that's 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 basically where we're at with the fund. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for that very comprehensive uh, presentation. And uh, yes, when uh, you have information about the various rounds, please do send it to members so that we can then send it out to our community groups and organisation within our own wards. So that will be very helpful to us uh, to have that information to pass on. Uh, so the first question on your presentation is from Councillor Murray. So we'll go over to Councillor Murray. Thank you, Michael. That was a brilliant presentation, I have to say, because I find that really interesting. The most interesting bits are the ones you've, um, to me, skimmed over slightly, which is from round four to round six about health and well-being and digital inclusion and young people. And and the, round, the digital inclusion just uh, proves what Councillor Peel and myself were. Uh, it's a concern for us uh, that people will get left behind if we haven't got plans in place. But it it sounds OK on the last, um, you know, where you put your outcomes. Uh, it sounds OK, but it's it's something that we'll have to keep our eye on. And I'm really glad we've got um, other partners on board because I think some of the um, uh, actions we've done in the past as a council um, as our previous uh, well one of our previous uh, chief execs used to say that uh, we grow the apples and the apples fall into somebody else's garden so they get the benefit of it so I'm glad people like CCG particularly are, are signing up to this um, so I'm really pleased about that and and it has allayed my fears a little bit more than than before but I am a bit sensitive about things like that but thanks Michael for that. Okay thank you. Thank you Councillor Murray. Uh, actually no other members have indicated that they wish to speak. If you wish to speak please uh, type um, speak into the chat box and um, Councillor Peel has just typed speaking to count into the chat box. So we'll go over to Councillor Peel. Councillor Peel. Yeah, sorry. Um, it's very difficult. I'm trying to um, uh, work the camera and uh, read the um, PowerPoints at the same time. And there's a blue box now just covered to that. So I didn't even know I was, I was live. Uh, right. So. Just going back to the slide on, on page nine, uh, following up uh, Councillor Murray's uh, comment uh, about digital in inclusion. Um, this concerns me really that the, the second, um, the opening of the second paragraph, very little bolt and specific data for digital exclusion. Um, how are we going to, how are we going to resolve that, Michael, uh, in terms of getting that data? Because you know, we, we, we do obviously have, have national data and there's no reason for us to think that trends in Bolton are any different uh, from the national data that we've got. So how do we, but, but how do we specifically uh, get uh, that information uh, for, for Bolton in terms of where uh, our resources are actually targeted? You know, where, where, where are the priorities uh, priority areas. We we are already seeing that. I think uh, some people think it's it's based on geography. I don't think there's any evidence of that at all. I think it's based on what the evidence is telling us, which is uh, age and um, uh, income bracket or e e economics. So where do, where do we get the evidence to build on this? Michael, yes, please please answer. Yes. Uh I mean, I think I think it's a it's a very good question, and I, and I think this this indicates to me why 
in terms of the evidence base that we use, it can't just be based on those national indicators and things that, 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 that we see. And I think this is one of the areas why uh, we are very clear that we have to use that insight that comes to us. If we, if we are made aware via uh, yourselves as members who have evidence of, of area, I, not, not areas, because it isn't about areas, but people who are being left behind, we can actually use that to help us shape the programme and how the programme will, will engage with people. Um, and it's why actually on, on this one in particular, our work with the voluntary sector and what they're telling us on, on what they're experiencing is really valuable for it. So I think this one is a, is a, is a good example of where we need, we need to understand that it's an issue and that's what the national data tells us. But I think it's actually more on this type of issue at, at the current time, it's more about what our, our local insight and intelligence tells us. Now, if the data, the data sets improve and we get access to better data sets, we will clearly use them. But for me, my response to this question is about, it really is about is making sure that we use that, that local insight effectively to, to help. I hope that answers the question. It, 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 it does, Jay. It's quite reassuring that um our, um, our very good officers who are leading on this are, are, are really thinking about this because, you know, as we keep saying, this is going to perhaps be one of the most important things uh, for the council as it moves on. Thank you, Councillor Bill. Thank you, Michael. We're going to go over to the cabinet area, uh, cabinet uh, member who covers this area of the council, uh, Councillor Muslin. Councillor Muslin. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I'm just picking up on the, the points, I suppose, that, um, that Councillor Peel just raised. Um, obviously, evidence is, is really important. You know, one of the big things we set out when we, when we launched the Bolton's Fund was that it would be, you know, uh, as much as it can be, an evidence-based um, approach to targeting um, the areas of concern. And it's because of evidence um, that we've gathered, you know, hopefully we've had a chance to review the presentation before tonight as well, that you'll see in the other um, rounds that we've got coming up and um, there's a lot of data in there backing up those um those rounds and also you know it's led to us reprioritizing certain rounds as well uh, you know bringing digital forward um is a key part of that because um you know through my dealings with uh, cbs and you know other uh, other members of the bcsc sector um, it's become pretty clear that um, many groups have, you know, um, either had to adapt successfully uh, in you know, using digital uh, during COVID, but on the other hand, um, many others have struggled as well. And so it's really important that not only can we support these groups that are already existing and um, just to enhance what they currently offer uh, and perhaps, you know, engaging with a wider audience that may have not engaged before, but also so, um, supporting other groups that are looking to engage with um, people on a more digital basis and get them more digitally active. As Councillor Murray um, mentioned before, you know, it is um, a keen um, sort of passion of hers to make sure that we aren't you know, excluding people and we aren't, we aren't leaving people behind. And I, as I've reiterated on many occasions um, at this committee, I firmly believe in that too. And so we just need to make sure that we are doing what we can to work with partners um, to s support people across the borough, whether they're in, uh, you know, Farnworth, in West Horton, in Bromley Cross, um, wherever, um, that they are getting the support. Because, as you say, this isn't located to specific areas nationally or locally. You know, it's just it's everywhere. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we're staying on top of that. Um, but more generally, what I was going to say um, before that, um, for Kessler Peel's comments was really that this is a great piece of work uh, and I'm really proud of the work that uh, Michael and the team have done uh, to get it to at the stage where it is now. We've had some really successful early rounds um, and you know it was unfortunate that we couldn't continue with where we were going to continue given the Covid crisis but actually it shows um, how adaptable and organic this, um, this fund is by um, changing to the Covid situation and actually um, offering grants um, pretty quickly, actually, with, still though with the same due diligence and, and, and importance and making sure that this is funding that is going out to the right places and to those that really need it. Uh, and we saw some really great results from the COVID, um, COVID grant. And, you know, we're at a stage now where things are starting, you know, ever so slightly you know, to return to normal. Uh, and think people can get on with doing what they were doing before and supporting their communities. And this fund, um, the restart of this fund will allow them to do that. 
And I think, you know, what's crucial about this as well is that we we continue to use this fund now to promote and support those groups that have become active during COVID. So they may not have existed in January, but by March, April, May, they were out there, they were doing things in their communities. And, you know, CVS are doing a lot of work to encourage uh, uh, those groups, uh, as well as we are the council, to stay active, stay, um, you know, hopefully get constituted and continue to support their communities. And, you know, hopefully get, having this um, funding come at this time as well, will allow them uh, to carry on doing the great work that they are doing. Um, and the last thing I'd say, you know, that if you know what other people will come up with later on, if there's any further questions, I might come back. But I just um, stress again, you all will have had my email um, last week about the state of the sector survey. Uh, and a couple of you did reply and say you would share that. So thank you. Um, but, you know, the, that that um, survey really does highlight you know some of the key challenges that the sector is facing across Bolton um, and also you know it helps us shape the priorities as well and the rounds that will come in the future so it really is important that if you do know any voluntary sector groups or you use any of your social media pages uh, to promote that survey just so we can get as much feedback as possible from the VCSC sector in Bolton to make sure that going forward, we as a local authority working with Bolton CVS are in the best position possible to help those groups. Um, but as you say, you know, that's all I really wanted to say. And if there's any further questions that any other people want to have, um, I'm more than happy to answer. But thank you, Chair. I think we'll ca carry on. I'm waiting for the red box and it's still on, on yourself, Councillor Muslin. So, but uh, thank you very much uh, for that. And we'll go over to Councillor Walsh, uh, who has a, a question as well. If the red box moves over to Councillor Walsh. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, not as so much a question as a comment. I have long been an advocate of a more transparent uh, process for grant distribution. So the council over the years has distributed hundreds of thousands of pounds of grants and I want to uh, first of all commend the officers for bringing together this scheme. I know there's been quite a lot of work gone into it but uh, I've certainly brought great transparency as we, we've seen this evening. It allows that targeting which I think is so vital and I do know from a number of grant applicants that they were thrilled at the speed with which uh, the matter was dealt with and the manner in which they were uh, welcomed and, and treated. And I do think that uh, the progress that's been made in a relatively short time in very difficult circumstances for the last uh, four or five months, officers deserve enormous credit for the work they've put into uh, delivering this programme in the transparent way that it has been uh, delivered and hopefully will continue to do so. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for those comments, uh, Councillor Walsh. We'll go over to the leader of the council, David Greenhouse, Councillor Greenhouse. Chair, I think we are actually lost John Ducky at the moment, so I think well, Councillor Greenhouse just wants to actually yes. speak. Yeah, 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 yes, just speak. Um, so, yeah, so just a couple of points, really. Um, first of all, I, I, I do want to commend the team um, and Council Muslim for, for the work that they've done in this area. And it it it, it really, I, I can't stress enough the, I feel, the improvement that the whole system in that people not only know exactly what they're uh, applying for and they can tailor their grants uh, in order to benefit and we actually address the outcomes that have been identifies through evidence based through the JSNA. So it, it's a great piece uh, of work and one that is working and, and, and hopefully will continue to work. And we will then start to be able to measure outcomes and we will see from the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment uh, of what, it, what is actually working and what is not. I just wanted to make um, a bit of a, a um, more detailed comment ar around the digital inclusion piece because I, I think um, it's very easy to see it in, in its in its own little box. This, whereas it connects so much to the well-being box, in in uh, because it, it's it's all about connectivity. This, and uh, certainly we've had some some great um, uh, anecdotal 
responses already from groups that benefited in the first round but had a bit of a digital input into it and michael correct me if i'm wrong i'm not sure it was some it was it was one of the organizations similar to the cystic fibrosis but i i'm not sure just which one it definitely was but it was certainly a health related organization group of friends mainly of a cohort that perhaps not would we be as digitally aware as some uh, and they use that uh, the, the, that money as a lifeline. They use digital um, connectivity with one another as a lifeline for them to be able to share their own experiences, for them to still connect as a group, to them still meet as friends online as a group, to share their own practices, share their own experiences uh, of living with the disease and, and what the, the, some of the problems they were encountering. So that, that is what this is all about in terms of the digital inclusion. It, it's not just about uh, getting everybody online to be able to access all different parts of services. It clearly has a huge impact on the well being of residents as well, who many of them, particularly those vulnerable, are feeling very isolated at the moment and in need of a little bit more um, connectivity. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for making that point, um, Leader. And could I thank Michael as well for an excellent presentation and please do send members, like I said, the um, the information so we can send it out to our constituents, our voluntary groups. Um, and it, thank you again for that presentation. Uh, and also, uh, it's good that John Duckett, our technical officer, is back with us. Um, we did continue the meeting without you, John, uh, but we certainly do need you uh, to move the red boxes around. And we'll go to our next agenda item, which is um, members' business. Uh, 10A is members' questions, and I've not been informed of any members' questions. I just want to check with our committee admin officer, Vicky, if, if any uh, came in. Yeah, Chair, I can confirm we haven't got any questions for this meeting. OK, thank you very much, Vicky. So moving on to 10B. Uh, these are extracts of uh, decisions arising from the minutes of other meetings relevant to the remit of this committee. Um, cabinet minutes on 29th of June 2020 and executive cabinet members, member leaders portfolio held on the 16th and 30th of June and the 16th of July 2020. Um, members have been sent these minutes in advance of this meeting. Um, if you wish to speak into your microphone, does any member wishes to raise anything on any of those set of minutes? That I don't think is, uh, is that's a no. Nobody's uh, spoken into microphones. So I think uh, all those minutes uh, we note. And uh, that then brings us to the conclusion of this scrutiny meeting because we've been through all the presentations the whole agenda. So could I just thank uh, firstly uh, all of the officers who um, presented to us this evening, answered all of our questions. Thank you officers, thank you to members and also thank you for the to the public if you're watching this online meeting. Our next meeting of the Scrutiny Committee will be on the 26th of October 2020 at 6 p.m. So I hope you'll be able to join us then. Uh, so until then, could I bid you a fond farewell and a very pleasant evening. Good evening. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you.